Hi everyone, today I'm going to be talking about the novel The Pulitzer Prize winner, A Confederacy of Dances by John Kennedy Toole. Let's go! you're a writer and you've ever tried to get your work traditionally published you'll know just how hard it is to get your writing seen let alone publish and more often than not you have to deal with rejection after rejection after rejection rejection after rejection after rejection and that's all to be expected after all it's what you signed up for isn't it a life in the arts nobody said it was going to be easy did they but let's face it rejection sucks and too much of it can be detrimental on your writing and also your well-being and someone who knew rejection all too well was the author of this wonderful novel, A Confederacy of Dances, John Kennedy Toole. Now John Toole, or as he was sometimes known as Ken to his friends, was born in 1937 in a middle-class family in New Orleans. His parents had a troubled marriage and John had a very topsy-turvy relationship with his mum, Thelma. Thelma was a real character. She was eccentric and very overprotective of John. And when he was little, she would often have him dress up in costumes and have him perform in front of house guests. She even gave elocution lessons and was adamant that her son John was gonna live a fabulous life. Intelligent and witty, John completed his first novel at the age of 16 titled The Neon Bible. It reeked of poverty and violence and he was so proud of his achievement. So much so that he decided to enter it into a competition. But when it failed to win first place, John put it away and never spoke of it ever again. At age 20, John was offered a fellowship at Columbia University, where he would go on to study for a master's in English. And after a year in New York, he decided to take a year off. To earn money, he became a teacher in Louisiana. And it was there that his true personality began to shine. The students considered him a wonderful teacher and people just seemed to gravitate towards him. He was a great mimic and he had a cheeky sense of humour and he was easy going and he would often throw his tie over his shoulder whenever he was off to somewhere important. In 1961, John was drafted by the US Army, but luckily they needed English teachers in Puerto Rico. And it was there that he had some of the best times of his life. Everyone loved him and he had the ability to get along with all kinds of people. He was away from his overbearing mum and he found it was a great chance to write. He didn't have to worry about making a living. He could simply save up money and begin work on his grand novel. For the first time in John's life, he felt like he was on top of the world. After his stint in the army, John returned home to New Orleans with hopes and an ace up his sleeve. A completed novel titled A Confederacy of Dunces. John allowed his mum, Thelma, to read the opening chapters and she absolutely loved it and she believed it was a true masterpiece. So John wasted no time and he sent the manuscript out to the publisher, Simon & Schuster. It was a publishing house that John respected for their previously published works he admired. And in John's eyes, they were the best of the best. 
The book eventually reached senior editor Robert Gottlieb, who thought the book had promise, but needed a whole bunch of work. For the next two years, Robert told John to make revisions. He kept saying, rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. And every time John would send back the revisions, Robert would send back more and more notes telling him to do more, rewrite. John, rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Because Robert didn't really think the book had any real plot. Finally, a committee decision was made to not publish the novel. And this decision absolutely crushed John. He felt in his heart that any more revisions would ultimately destroy his work. And when John later arranged to visit Robert in his office in New York, Robert ended up not being there. And John was really embarrassed and he ended up falling into a deep depression. John felt that if he couldn't have the best publisher in the world, then he would rather have no publisher at all. And so he boxed up the manuscript and stored it away at his parents' house, where it remained for a decade. With his confidence corroded and now feeling like a failure, and what with his mother's overbearing nature and his father's decline in health, John started to look at the world differently. It was now 1968 and the world was changing. Apollo 8 had arrived in orbit around the moon, Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated in Los Angeles, Martin Luther King in Memphis, and the Vietnam War was raging on. It was clear that the summer of love was over. John spent the Christmas holidays that year confined to his parents' house. And in January of 1969, after a terrible fight with Thelma, John ran out of the house and withdrew $1,500 from his bank and jumped into his car. He had decided to cut ties and run away from everything and everyone. And he was heading for California. And so John spent the next 66 days on the road, eating junk food and staying in motels and visiting places of meaning. He traveled to San Simeon. He visited the mansion Hearst Castle and he drove along the Pacific Coast Highway. It was a farewell tour. John was looking for answers that would never arrive. His search for Jack Kerouac and the ghost of Marilyn Monroe would ultimately come up empty. There was no letters home, no phone calls, and poor Thelma was back home in New Orleans, searching frantically for her beloved son, John. John Kennedy Toole had made the most important decision of his life, and so began to head back to New Orleans. And it was on March 25th, 1969, Biloxi police discovered a car sitting silently in the woods. A green garden hose was leading from the exhaust pipe all the way up to the driver's side window. There were papers stacked on the front seat and on the dashboard, there was a note to John's parents. Thelma would later burn that note and only three people ended up attending John's funeral, his parents and his childhood nursemaid. The act of suicide had brought shame upon John's family. For the next two years, Thelma fell into a deep decline. But then one day she was walking by John's bedroom and she noticed the box with the manuscript. And so she thought to herself, okay, so John couldn't get it published but maybe I could. Full of hope, Thelma circulated the tatty dog-eared manuscript to publisher after publisher. And every time it would come back more stained and battered with a rejection slip attached. But then she would send it out again, first class, and then it would come back, rejected, rejected, 
rejected, rejected, rejected, rejected. And with every rejection, Thelma died a little inside because in her heart she believed in the book and she still believed in her son. Then one day Thelma heard that the author, Walker Percy, was becoming a faculty member at the university. And so she put on a nice little hat and her best lace dress and she ordered her driver to take me immediately to Loyola University. At first, Walker Percy thought Thelma was mental. He just thought she was some old crazy lady that couldn't take no for an answer. But Thelma was so insistent that he felt pressured to read John's manuscript. And from the very first page, Walker Percy loved it. He thought it was the work of genius, a true historical masterpiece that captured the essence of New Orleans. And so a confederacy of dunces went on to be traditionally published. After its initial release, the book gained a tremendous amount of attention and rave reviews. And in 1981, it was finally awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. And since its publication, the novel has been transcribed into 37 languages. How cool is that? The book's success immediately propelled Thelma into the spotlight and she loved every minute of it. She bathed in the glory of her son's success and she gave readings and television interviews and in a way it was vindication of herself and her way of keeping her beloved John alive. But if only John had been more persistent, why didn't he send the book out to more publishers? If only John had stuck to his guns and held on to his dream a little longer. He was only 31 when he died. He would have loved his success. After all, it was always his dream to be a famous writer. But unfortunately, John never got the chance to enjoy it. So there you have it, the tragic story of John Kennedy Toole. It just goes to show that if you believe in something, then you should never give up on it, ever. <laughs> Even if the world is telling you it stinks. So thank you for joining me on this adventure. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you're new to the channel, which I'm sure you are, please consider subscribing. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And until next time, I'll see you in the next video where we go into the unknown. Take care guys. See ya.